this material in the past, um, but we're gonna go through it all again. I have a couple little disclosures to make. Um, I've got a patent pending for the surgical method that I developed. Um, I, it says I'm founder and vice president of the laser chapter of the Focal Therapy Society. I need to update that. Um, I'm now the, the chairperson of the patient advocacy committee in the Focal Therapy Society. Um, tonight, we're gonna to talk about history of biopsy strategies, why we do what we do, the evolution of multiparametric prostate MRI, technical aspects of MR-guided biopsy, the rationale for MR-guided laser focal therapy of prostate cancer, and an update on our phase two clinical trial. Time permitting, we'll talk a bit about tissue-based genomics. Um, Dr. Hers, myself, and the rest of the team can take questions from the participants. And um, let's get going. So much of what um, we've done in prostate cancer mirrors what happened in breast cancer uh, in terms of imaging and management. My early research was in breast cancer. My nickname used to be the breast lady. Now it's the prostate lady. And I'm not sure which is um, <laughs> more interesting. But uh, my philosophy for a long time was if it looks like a skunk and it smells like a skunk, it's probably a skunk. So if we could see something and we can um, aim at it, we could put a device or a needle or a, a fiber inside of it. So just like um, uh, radical mastectomy went to lumpectomy over the years, you know, focal therapy has evolved as a viable option to whole gland therapy. When we look at the way biopsies have been done since the very beginning, um, we're going to walk through the peer-reviewed uh, literature related to prostate biopsy beginning in the 1920s, way, way back in the 20s, and then ending up where um, I had co-authored a paper on a transrectal MR guided biopsy. So back in the day, they would do an incision in the, um, in the perineum and look around, and if they saw something, they would take a piece of it. Then um, a technique was developed where a stainless steel sound was inserted down the urethra to stabilize everything and a finger was inserted into the rectum and they would feel the gland and aim at things. But that sort of um, is problematic because really the only thing that could be reached is the back, not the front. Then um, Watanabe-san and his team in Japan came up with the first clinically useful ultrasound images in the late 60s. And around that same time, McNeil et al. proposed the three uh, currently used uh, glandular zones of the prostate, the peripheral zone, the central zone, and the transition zone. So what this did was it made it so that whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a um, radiologist, a pathologist, everyone's talking about the same anatomy the same way. In the 80s, we had the evolution of transcavity transducers, these little ultrasound wands that used to go just outside the body to take pictures and reflect sound waves back to make images. Now they could be inserted inside the body, um, transvaginal transducers for looking at female um, internal organs, and then the transrectal probe for other things like prostate. And then my friend Dick Ablin developed the PSA test back in the 80s and the FDA um, cleared it for use as a screening blood test. And Hodge et al. developed the sextant biopsy technique, which is taking six samples under ultrasound guidance. Well, fast forward to the 90s, then Stamey and Eskew thought, well, if six is good, 18 or 24 might even be better. So uh, this, the sextant biopsy schema was replaced with what looks more like this. Rather than taking just the red targets, they would take maybe the blue targets or the red and the blue or the red and the green or the red, blue and the green. The problem is what if the tumor is here? What if it's here? What if it's over here? You're not going to get it. The other issue with this is this is just going in the left, right, and front back direction. It doesn't take depth into account. So then Winston Barzell came up with the template mapping technique where um, some call it saturation biopsy. Every three millimeters transperineally uh, needles are um, inserted and removed to acquire specimens over the entirety of the gland. 
But again, the trouble here is this is um, going left to right and this is going front to back. What about depth? We're not capturing things in a large gland that could be far away from the sampling area. So what does a template mapping or saturation biopsy look like? Uh, these slides were given to me by my friend, Dr. Tom Palasik from Duke. Um, <clears throat> here you'll see an image of um, the ultrasound screen. And on the ultrasound screen, you've got the prostate gland, looking at it from the side. And this is the bladder up above it. The bright white is the bladder wall and the black stuff is urine. And then the feet are at this end, and the head is at this end. So coming in from underneath, you see the needle going into the prostate. And in the monitor, you see the reflection there of the gloved hands of the urologist holding the transducer. So that needle's going into the gland, but where's it going? We don't know. So they have this template on the patient. It's kind of an ABC, one, two, three, I sunk your battleship. And then you end up with specimen cups that look like this. So each of these cups is two to $300 per for patho pathologic evaluation. So early in the day when we did this, like 14 years ago, when people would say, oh my God, MRI is so expensive. You know, it's not expensive relative to pathologic evaluation of um, specimens taken every three millimeters. And this is kind of a not so funny slide, you know, good news, the exploratory surgery turned up negative. That's like these biopsies where they go in and they take 30, 60 cores and the tumor is distant to the needle and you'll never reach it in a million years, but the biopsy is negative. Yay, good news. No, it's not good news. The biopsy is negative, but the disease is still there. It's just unable to be sampled because of its position. So how does MRI solve this? Well, the very first cases uh, were done at Charity Berlin where the MRI scan was used to aim a little device uh, transrectally at the thing that looks abnormal. Gee, if you could see it, you could put a needle in it. And again, here's the ultrasound image that really now that ultrasound is uh, evolving sort of the micro ultrasound high resolution so you look, techniques. Oh, I, know that I, know it came, I know it came out in her lab. Hi, Kathy. <laughs> Hi, Kathy. <laughs> um, if you want to hit your mute button, thank you. So um, the images are a lot better than this nowadays, but not nearly as good as this. And this is from 13 years ago. So these images of the prostate using MRI are much more reliable to find suspicious areas than just seeing the margin of the gland. National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines have evolved over the years. Way back in the day, it was pretty much repeat test after repeat test after repeat test. And then um, fast forward to 2012, multi-parametric MRI was mentioned for the first time in the guidelines. So it was becoming more and more accepted. Um, our teams in Europe really influenced the um, swinging of the pendulum in the United States through their uh, European Society of Urogenital Radiology Guidelines published in 2012, which acted sort of as a bridge between the European guidelines and the American College of Radiology, PIRADS guidelines. So uh, many of the people you see on this publication and our friend, Dr. Verma, um, are also involved in the PIRADS guidelines, which I also serve on those committees. And PIRADS is simply um, standardized language, a lexicon that talks about how suspicious something looks on the MRI and it's common language used among radiologists. So if it's dark on one sequence and also dark on another sequence and bright on a sequence uh, showing cellular diffusion, and then if it takes up contrast quickly and spits it out and it, it shows um, uh, signs of neovascularity and um, sucks up the contrast really quickly. That's all suspicious stuff, but the images themselves can't really say if there's something malignant. Things can look funny in an MRI, um, but in this particular case, the only thing that was cancer was here. And this is biopsy proven cancer. This is biopsy proven prostatitis, these little butterfly wings 
that appear on both the left and the right very symmetrically like a mirror image of each other. And then this junk in the middle, this uh, messy looking stuff is BPH. So the one thing that stands out like a sore thumb on this color overlay of the diffusion sequence, which is the one that measures cellular compactness is the cancer. So we can't really rely on MRI alone to say, oh, it's cancer because all this stuff looks funny. Everything was biopsied and the one thing with the restricted diffusion was the thing that ended up being cancer. So while imaging is great, we need biopsy to say for sure. One of the other things that we use prognostically is PSA density, which is simply um, the gland volume divided into the PSA. So imagine a person with a gland the size of an apricot and another person with a gland the size of a grapefruit. Um, they both have a PSA of four. The person with the smaller gland will have a higher PSA density. There's more PSA uh, uh, being produced and, and held in that little gland than there is the big gland. Now we fast forward to 2016 and here, not only do they talk about multiparametric MRI, um, they say, that doing it before biopsy can maximize detection of high-risk disease and limit detection of low-risk disease. That's a very important thing because everybody talked years ago about, oh my gosh, you know, over-treatment, over-detection, over-diagnosis. Well, if we identify what it is and categorize it properly, we could put men on active surveillance who should be on active surveillance. We could treat guys who should be treated and it's logical. So there's none of this hedging your bet and treating a guy radically when he's got low grade, low volume appearing disease uh, when in fact it's something more. The American Urological Association policy statement back in October, 2019 was modified to say, hey, if it's an elevated PSA, do MRI before biopsy. And what's wonderful is uh, this is a group of very smart urologists um, they were also joined by a couple radiologists uh, to make that policy statement. Now fast forward further to 2020. The guidelines talk about elevated PSA and then go on to talk about further evaluation for biopsy. So here they talk about MR targeting. They mention um, things like biomarkers, 4K score, XODX, um, biomarkers mentioned again in great detail. We offer the XODX prostate test, which is a urine test. And um, it's interesting um, to mention uh, that systematic biopsy is still something we will do in certain cases if the XODX score is high and the MRI is sort of indeterminate a saturation biopsy or traditional trust biopsy may be indicated. So again, here it says multiparametric MRI before and targeting maximized detection of high-risk disease and limit detection of low-risk disease. I'm not even smart and that makes a lot of sense to me. So um, MRIs evolved a lot over the years and this was published by the team I'm studying under in NIMAG and um, in radiology back in 2006. And MRI with only three sequences had a accuracy of about 91% for detection of clinically significant prostate cancer. The team at Yale repeated this study in uh, 2016, 10 years later, and came up with an accuracy of around 96%. So we know MRI has an important role in detection and diagnosis. Um, now I'm gonna talk to you about the inverse linear relationship of that um, diffusion value I mentioned earlier to aggressiveness of disease. And you'll notice this paper was published on a 3T magnet. I'm not gonna argue or debate, you know, 3T, one and a half T. I hear all the time, 3T is the best and you can't do anything without a 3T, but that's, that's a myth. That's a, a myth that's been debunked in the literature. And I'm gonna show you some reasons why 1.5T can actually be preferable over 3T when it comes to doing interventional uh, procedures in MRI. The things that matter way, way more than field strength are things like the skill of the operator. You need a tech that knows what the heck they're doing, 
um, how to position the patient, how to position the coil, how to optimize the parameters at the operator console. Um, you know, they're command central. They need to know what they're doing. The software on the scanner itself, it's got to be modern, state-of-the-art, and ability to do these diffusion-weighted sequences of a level of quality that's acceptable and in line with the American College of Radiology guidelines. The coil or the antenna that they use to pick up the signal from the prostate um, needs to be a high channel count coil, either internal, exter external. We happen to use external coils because most patients I talk to don't like something uh, 16 centimeters in circumference inserted in the rectum. I'm generally not fans of that. So um, also I've had a lot of patients that have a surgery that renders their rectum inaccessible. So if the guy has no rectum, well, how can you say he can't have a prostate MRI? We need to find a way to do it with external coils. So if we could do the external coil solution for the guy with no rectum and have good images, well, why don't we just do it that way for everybody? That's the way I think about it. Other people may argue with me, but um, that's a different discussion. The preparation of the patient is extremely important. If I find out a guy had a bean burrito for breakfast and they wanna add him on for a prostate MRI, you don't even bother because the images will be terrible because of the peristalsis, the digestive uh, movement of the, um, of the organs in the abdomen and the pelvis. So some sites go so far as to inject a hormone called glucagon to minimize uh, the digestive activity in the abdomen and pelvis. Uh, we don't do that. We just have the patient go NPO. In other words, don't eat anything or drink anything for like eight hours, 10 hours before the exam. Um, and you can have all four of these things lined up perfectly, but if the person interpreting the images, if the, if the radiologist doesn't know what they're doing, they can miss things. And then something that's not obvious to most people is um, these numbers are from 2013. I know they're 10 years old, but generally speaking, the vast majority of magnets in North America are 1.5 Tesla only around 10% are three Tesla. So if we're operating under the understanding that MRI is great, it's great for detection and localization, um, and we want access for men, we don't want every guy to have to fly to an academic hospital to get a three Tesla MRI. That's not practical and it's nonsensical because when you look at all the guidelines in Europe and the United States, all the experts in prostate MRI agree that 3T MRI and 1.5T MRI with the proper parameters, operator software, coil, patient prep and interpreter, they're equally good for detection and localization of clinically significant prostate cancer. Now, are they equally good for um, um, uh, fiber tracking in the brain? No but that's not what we're doing here. If I wanna do fiber tracking in the brain, of course, I'm gonna get a 3T magnet and do that. But if I'm looking at the prostate with a small field of view and the pelvis with a large field of view, 1.5T and 3T are equally good. The other thing that's important to understand, and I did device development for many years, these devices that we use are metal. There are different types of metal. And the devices that we use, the vast majority of them, not all of them, are radio frequency induction tested up to 1.5 Tesla. In layman's terms, scientists and engineers put these things in magnets in different situations with the, with the scanner um, in acquisition mode or not to see if currents were um, conducted through the devices because you don't want the doctor to be in the middle of a procedure and have him get shocked by something or have the patient burned by an instrument that's receiving radio frequency energy. The other thing about 1.5T versus 3T is anything bad at 1.5T is worse at 3T. The things that interfere with image quality um, can be really bad. And um, this is a 3T image on the right using an endorectal coil. And while the coil is very good at looking at the detail of the neurovascular bundles here on the left and here on the right, you've got to use all kinds of filtration and uh, other things to be able to visualize the front of the gland, which is obscured 
right here. So in order to see the back, you can't see the front and vice versa. On 1.5T with an external coil, we see everything. We see the bones of the hips. We see everything we wanna see and more. Another thing that I wanted to point out is the blurring and the, and the um, problems that we get with breathing and digestion. They're worse at three Tesla. So this is the same patient um, scanned at 1.5 Tesla and three Tesla. There's some blurring and ringing artifact going through the front of the image and kind of blurry looking prostate. A lot more detail here. The cyst looks more obvious and just a lot more um, detail on the 1.5 T because there's less artifact. So going back to the paper and what was proven here is when we measure the apparent diffusion coefficient value on the MRI, this is a number assigned on the sequence, when we hover over it with a little arrow, it gives us a number. And the lower the number, typically the more aggressive the cancer. So um, this mean ADC value, this is 1.24, that we move a couple decimal points to get 1,240. The whole mount histology shows low grade three plus three cancer. Not anything to be super excited about. Um, Further workup, obviously, in clinical correlation, family history, et cetera, will determine if this person needs um, active surveillance or definitive therapy. Now, look at this one, a darker lesion, and the value of the ADC is 990. This one's a three plus four on whole mount histology. This guy needs definitive treatment. And then when we look at this black area here with an ADC of 660, this one's Gleason 9. So the general understanding, and this, this isn't, you know, 100% all the time, but the general understanding is that there's a linear inverse relationship between apparent diffusion coefficient value and aggressiveness of cancer. So the lower the ADC, the higher the Gleason score. And again, if it looks dark on the T2 weighted anatomic sequence, and it's bright on the high B value diffusion sequence and dark on the apparent diffusion coefficient image, and it's perfusing like crazy with the MRI contrast, you want to stick a needle in it. That's the only way to determine exactly what it is from a Gleason scoring perspective. Now, here we see the ADC value 691, it's low, and right there is where it's 691. If we move that little cursor just a little bit, now the ADC is over a thousand. That's not where we want the needle to fall. We want the needle over here because this is the most valuable, um, helpful tissue that we can get information from to properly stage and grade. So going back to, well, you know, why was trust biopsy a problem and, and why is MR guidance so much better? because we see the whole gland, we're not relying on feeling something with a finger because a finger can reach all around here, but it can't reach up here in the front. So it's not unusual for us to have a patient who presents with high PSA, multiple negative transrectal ultrasound guided biopsies because simply by virtue of the limitations of the throw of the biopsy gun under ultrasound, you can't go further than about two centimeters anything further than that you're going to miss. Biopsy every year for 10 years, you're not going to get it. Unless, of course, it grows so large that it's now in this area within reach. So that's a problem. The other problem is if there's something um, anterior and then you pick up something inconsequential back here, you're going to go, oh, I got it. I got it. So we're going to treat this person conservatively because this is no big deal, but you don't realize that this thing's sitting over here. And then again, let's say the bad thing is back here within reach and you only skim the edge of it instead of that spot that, that is the lowest apparent diffusion coefficient. You're also doing the patient a disservice by, by getting something that while, it, while it's there, it's not the worst of the worst. So this um, was proven out by the team in Nijmegen. Uh, Dr. Thomas Hambrock won a, a very cool a radiology award called the Lauterborough Award. And he demonstrated that doing 10 core biopsy randomly versus using MR image guidance, you double the, the detection of 
clinically significant cancer by inserting the MR. And none of this is news. Um, I co-authored a number of papers on this topic over the years. And, um, you know, like I said, it, it makes perfect sense, but getting people to actually do it was like pulling teeth. Um, what's it look like for the patient? Super simple. They lay on their tummy. There's this um, coil, the antenna thingamajig that goes on the back of the patient and the front of the patient. A little tiny needle guide is inserted in the rectum. And then this thing is mounted to the table to hold that needle guide in place. Images are acquired. We use software to aim at the thing we want to take a piece of. And it's like a video game. It's kind of cool, actually. When you insert the needle guide, you could see the trajectory of what you're aiming for. The computer tells us how far to angle in each direction to achieve that target. We adjust to that location, pop in the needle, and ta-da, we get the specimen. Um, this is what it looks like in the hands of the physician. And then when the needle comes out, the little tiny chamber at the tip is holding a piece of flesh. And that little thing is about the caliber of angel hair pasta, and it's just under two centimeters long. That thing gets put in a cup of formalin, just like what you saw before. That gets shipped off to the laboratory and a cytology tech will take these specimens out and slice them paper thin and put dye on them. And that's what goes under the microscope. That's what the pathologist looks at on the slide and looks at the cellular architecture and patterns and assigns a Gleason score based on what they see. So our reports are very special, I like to think, because we have the worst part of what is seen on page one. So like rather than going through a storybook, a seven page narrative to find out what the heck is going on, page one is the big news. It's what's going on, where it is, how much of it is there, and what all is involved. And oh, by the way, a pretty picture of the needle in the throne position is captured and put right next to a photomicrograph of the cells that are being described right here. So literally in a court of law, it's indisputable where the tissue came from. And for those of you that don't understand what Gleason score is, what it is, why does it matter? Um, it's simply the sum of two numbers. I call it Skittle sorting. If we were in person right now, I'd open a bag of Skittles on the desk and I'd group them by color. So Gleason grade, primary Gleason grade plus secondary Gleason grade is the Gleason score. The primary Gleason grade is what the pathologist sees the most of under the microscope. When they put that slide under there and they look look around at the whole specimen, they're like, holy cow, there's a whole bunch of this. Let's say there's a whole bunch of Gleason 3. That's the primary Gleason grade. Then they keep looking at it. They look at the cellular architecture, the patterns and the behavior uh, features, and then they assign the secondary Gleason grade. And let's say in this case, it's a 4. So 3 plus 4 equals 7. That person's a Gleason 7. Now let's say next patient comes in, most of the pattern is four, and then the secondary grade is three. That person's a four plus three, also a seven, but their prognosis is worse because four is the dominant pattern, not three. And if that doesn't make sense to anybody, pop your hand up, ask the question, I could go over it again, but this is Gleason scoring in a nutshell. Now, when patients come to us, they get a proper consultation with Dr. Hers and our staff. And uh, sometimes I'm in the call, sometimes I'm not as, as things are evolving and we have a larger urology team. Um, there's more urologists and, and nurses to have these phone calls. Um, and we talk about everything. We talk about um, the role of active surveillance, surgery, um, uh, other focal therapies, immunotherapy, we talk about it all in the context of that individual patient. This is a very personal um, situation medically. And uh, while there are some institutions
Can anybody hear Bernadette? No. No, I can't. No. I thought it was me. We still can't hear you. <laughs> I don't know what happened. You're not showing muted on my end. Jim? Now we may have to go to a phone, hang on. Do you have that um, meeting ID by chance? Me? I don't. Mm, it's in that. I've got it, Jim. Okay, go ahead. 957 1622 6703. Great. 757 1622 6703. That's it. All right, I'm going to text it to her. <laughs> Is it our internet connection, Jim? We can still see her. We just can't hear. There's something in her computer, I'd say, with her <laughs> with her uh, audio. Maybe she should disconnect and reconnect. Two slides or three slides from the end. Two or three slides ago. Hey. Can you see my screen? No. We see you, not your PowerPoint. You see the PowerPoint? Now we can. Yay. Whew. Okay. Now. That's where we left off. That's where we lost you. Okay. So um, what I was trying to convey here is that when you do, you or somebody has a proper consultation with Dr. Hers the rest of the urology team and the focal therapy team, we talk about everything. Um, we're not there to coerce you or force you or talk in anything. You've reached out to us because you want something um, that will preserve quality of life while achieving oncologic control. And that's why we're here. But it's very important for patients to understand that there are other things 
these things exist. They have their benefits. They have their drawbacks. And then once a patient is fully educated, we feel comfortable that they've been given the information they need to make an informed decision. So with that, we'll go to the update on our phase two clinical trial, which will be celebrating its 13th year on May 24th, 2023. I still cannot believe it. And I was starting to say, you know, when we did the first human being up until we did like our first 20, we we weren't sure. We We were very, this is why it's called a clinical trial. We needed to do phase one to prove we didn't kill anybody or hurt anybody uh, in a bad way. And then we had to do phase two to understand efficacy. So that's the difference between phase one and phase two. Phase one, is it feasible? Can you do it without injuring or killing anybody? Um, phase two is, okay, now that we've proven it is safe and doable, just because you can do it, should you do it? And this is where the rubber meets the road. We were able to prove that not only is our technique as good as, but possibly better than prostatectomy and radiation with like less than 1% of the side effects in our hands. Overall, everybody on the planet that's doing this, the complication rates are less than 10%. So I think, you know, there's a lot to be said for research. Dr. Feller jokes that nothing ruins good results like follow-up. So, and I have to agree because many times when I get up at these international meetings and I talk to an audience of physicians about the very things I'm showing you tonight, I get some joker out in the audience that'll say, yeah, yeah, and who ran your numbers? Implying that I did my own statistical analysis, but I don't. We hire an outside biostatistician that um, our research coordinators will send him a de-identified Excel spreadsheet every three months, and he spits out a report telling us how we're doing, and it's completely and utterly objective. Um, the other thing is the oversight of our research. Um, some of you may have heard of what's called an armchair IRB like an, a company comes up with a new product or a thing, and then the leadership, if they're physicians or clinicians, they might get together and get all their friends to form an IRB and approve their own research kind of thing. That's a an old days kind of a situation, but there, there are IRBs that are associated with the people doing the research, and that's not us. We use an outside IRB that is in no way affiliated with us, and there's uh, uh, no um, uh, conflicts of interest there. So what, what does the procedure look like? Just like the biopsy, essentially, we use that very same little needle guide to gain access transrectally. And for those of you who didn't know this, this is my finger. I'm a little person. And so this thing is smaller than a female's finger. Um, the diffusion uh, tip that we use to deliver the energy is um, super tiny. Uh, it goes through a little applicator the size of a, of a regular uh, biopsy needle. So nothing here is huge and, and scary. It's all the same size as everything that they've been using for biopsy or smaller. When people ask me, when's the FDA going to approve this? I understand the question, but it, it, um, it doesn't make sense because everything we use is FDA cleared already. Everything we use is FDA cleared. I think the intended question is when is CMS going to pay for this? Um, CMS won't pay for a thing in prostate cancer until it has demonstrated uh, 15 to 20 year results. Because of the very nature of prostate cancer and typical prostate cancers being slow growing and indolent, they want to see 15 to 20 year outcomes. And there's not much I can do to speed up that clock. In fact, there's nothing I can do to speed up that clock. And I often tell people, uh, my feet are still purple. We can't drink the wine. When we hit 15 years, our our research team will start um, really inquiring with the payers. Well, why not? Why not? We've got 15 years demonstrated safety and 15 years demonstrated efficacy. So um, hopefully we'll have good news in two to five years. Um, the laser applicator, the box itself has been FDA cleared for many years. Um, and it was originally used in brains. I don't know if you could see on this monitor up here, 
that structure there is a brain. So this technology was used in the brains of kids for intractable epilepsy. And my philosophy when it was adapted to prostate cancer was simply, if it's safe enough to use in the brain of a kid, why not use it in the prostate? And it seemed reasonable, so we did it. Um, there's a couple different kind of fibers that we use. I showed you the cooled one a couple slides ago. This one is non-cooled. In other words, the fiber is naked. It doesn't go into a water-cooled sheath, and it's reserved for large treatments, big stuff, um, and also BPH treatments. And you can see this little experiment I did with that fiber. It's very strong, very powerful. In only a minute and a half of treatment, I was able to achieve a little bigger than um, half a centimeter coagulation necrosis. And there's the team that did that little experiment. And I wanted to show you what it looks like for the, the technologist that's running the scanner. So when they do an MR scan, they've got to plug in all these different parameters, fancy things like um, echo time, repetition time, flip angle, bandwidth, blah, blah, blah. All these things they optimize to do certain things. Well, we can exploit tissue contrast on an image. We can measure flow. We can measure perfusion of um, contrast. We can measure cellular diffusion or compactness. And we can also measure phase shifts. And the phase shifts along the magnetic gradient, um, we use very fancy calculus called RNAs modeling to convert the raw MRI data that the technologist plugs into the scan console and that would ordinarily generate images. It generates the images, but also converts to thermal maps. So we're able to see what we're cooking as we cook it. As the patient is being treated, you could see the endorectal needle guide is there, the fibers inserted. When we turn on the laser, there's a graph that measures temperature change over the course of time, anatomic images that show us what's being affected by the energy we're depositing, and then a cumulative representation of anything that exceeded 60 degrees Celsius. So dead tissue is represented by these little orange blobs. Now, all this extraneous stuff out here is just noise, uh, motion, things that don't matter. The, the fiber is here. The fiber is not over here. So um, all these little things are just blood vessels and uh, muscle twitches and stuff like that. So the beauty of the technique that we use is we're able to contour to the area that we want to destroy, and we put little borders around what we don't want to destroy. This is how we're able to protect the nerves responsible for erection, uh, the, the uh, rectal wall itself, and the muscle responsible for um, controlling urination. And it's, it's such a precise technique that even in patients that have had a prostatectomy, if the cancer decides to come back after the whole gland is taken out, which it does, a lot of men think, oh, I'm getting a prostatectomy because I want it out. It's got to be out and gone forever. But even in the case of having had a prostatectomy, the cancer can come back. And it's usually at the place where the urethra is, or is reattached to the bladder. So this is a, um, a common site for prostate cancer recurrence after prostatectomy. So it's a kind of now you see it, now you don't. And I, I tweeted it a couple days after we did it just to show, you know, it is tricky, but it can be done. And the reason why is when you rack and stack all energy sources, as I said before, they all have benefits and drawbacks. The big benefit of laser is that you could achieve high temperature that's very precise and very controllable, and you can protect things that need to be protected. So um, the first time I described this was at the um, European Society of Radiology back in 2011. So it's not, you know, witchcraft or a big mystery. I didn't talk about everything in great detail, but I did show the gist of, of what we were doing. And so um, a case study to represent uh, what it looks like is here's an axial image kind of slicing the patient like a loaf of bread. And here's the prostate gland. And this is the tumor. Um, and here is that diffusion sequence that I talked about that shows cellular compactness. He was treated and what resulted was this big area of tissue death. That's just nothing but dead tissue. And here's the um, 
cumulative dose represented, and here's a thermal map showing uh, the temperatures that we achieved. This is a view from the side. Here you see that endorectal needle guide going in. Um, here is the prostate gland. Up above it is the bladder. And then here's a tall version of, of that treatment area from the side. For all of our research patients, we see them at six months for imaging and biopsy. And we biopsy the treatment area even if we see nothing. If there's no contrast enhancement, no abnormality on any of the sequences, we still biopsy. Because all we could say if we didn't is, yeah, we think we got it. You know, thinking you got it's no good in, in research. You have to prove that you succeeded. And the only measure of success or failure is biopsy of the treatment site. So the good news for him was he had a negative biopsy at six months and he's living happily ever after. He, he was within uh, uh, our, our first 10 patients. So he's almost 13 years old. Hello? Um, so again, everything's got its benefits and drawbacks. When we compare high intensity focused ultrasound to cryotherapy, to laser, the kicker here is they all kill tissue, they do. But what is the distance between what's dead and what's alive? In laser, it's only a millimeter. It's a very thin transition between dead and viable tissue. In cryo and hyphu, it could be five to 10 millimeters thick. So are there cells living in here that may declare themselves later as recurrence? I don't know. Same here, this is dead. But what's this? Is any of this viable? And if so, are there any cancer cells in there? I don't know. But what I do know is that laser um, done appropriately will kill what's MR visible. And we expand that treatment to get about a centimeter margin around it because we all know MRI can underestimate the true lesion size. So we go beyond what we see. And then there's just this itty bitty thin uh, space between what's dead and what's not. This is how we're able to get so close to the neurovascular bundles and other structures and um, preserve quality of life. So here's just a synopsis of um, a point in time where we had done 181 cases under the clinical trial. We've completed 200. And uh, this is a summary of what was available back then. 26 of these men were what we call salvage patients. In other words, they had radiation they had prostatectomy or they had some other form of definitive treatment, but their cancer came back. And we never like hearing that, but when it does happen, rather than going after something um, super toxic or, or aggressive, laser can be suitable in the salvage setting. Uh, and in some cases, the men have had everything that they can have and there's nothing left. So we do salvage palliative laser focal therapy. And sometimes it's not so focal. We have one case uh, where there was a local recurrence plus invasion of the seminal vesicle and the inferior wall, the urinary bladder. What we did was went in and debulked all of those tumors to quiet uh, the mothership and, and keep it from metastasizing because um, the thing that we're most proud of is our metastasis-free survival rate. Every man that we've treated is doing well without distant disease. So um, that's, that's a fact. Um, we see men of all ages. Um, the clinical trial, uh, there was a, a window of, of years uh, uh, age that we would see patients. Uh, tumor location was irrelevant. Uh, it didn't matter where it was. Um, and the Gleason score didn't matter. Uh, somebody on a blog somewhere said, oh, those guys those guys in the desert, <laughs> that's what they call us sometimes, those guys in the desert only do three plus three, which is a, a, a false statement. Um, we do large volume MR visible three plus three, and in our entire cohort, that's only about a quarter of them. The vast majority of what we treat is Gleason 7, and in the salvage setting, we will do uh, Gleason 10 and um, others and locations like seminal vesicles and bladder walls. So what happens to the PSA after laser focal therapy, it goes down. And uh, in the 
uh, treatment naive patients, um, uh, it'll go down considerably, but in the salvage patients, it'll go down around 60% because typically these men present with a much higher PSA uh, because of their prior treatment and uh, recurrence and PSA spike. The sexual health of our research subjects um, is maintained. There's no statistically significant change overall. Um, what I find um, uh, interesting is the um, urinary function isn't statistically changed at all either, but the emotional well-being of the patients is remarkably uh, changed. So in the treatment naive guys, they come in worried and they stay moderately worried uh, all the way out to one year. They start getting a little bit more worried than at the beginning at six months because it's six months biopsy time. And this is seen also in the salvage population at six months, they start getting worried again. They're calmed down at around three months because they got treated and they're feeling pretty good. And uh oh, it's biopsy time. And then at 12 months after the six month biopsy comes back with a bunch of good news and they're a year out, that's when they could sleep at night. So our 10 year biopsy results overall, the important number to, to remember is the marginal recurrence rate overall is around 20%. That is non-inferior to prostatectomy and radiation. So if, if you know, um, the theory is, you know, oh, you know, focal therapy is, is terrible because there's a 20% recurrence rate. Yeah, but there's a 20% recurrence rate with everything else too. So um, nothing is perfect. The, the important thing is, as I said before, um, at this time, we only had one case of uh, bone metastasis. The patient was treated with systemic therapy and is still alive. Uh, we've since had one more case, but that keeps our um, metastasis-free survival at around 99%. Only two guys out of 200 develop bone mess. At 10 years, none of our research subjects have died of their prostate cancer. And that's uh, pretty remarkable. Now, patients have passed away of other things. The most common is melanoma. So if you could please work a skin exam into your next physical, um, could help you out. Um, the other things were um, Parkinson's, um, esophageal cancer surgery complications, and uh, an other primary cancer, not prostate. So I know we ran over because of technical problems, so I'm not going to beat the drum about why focal therapy is a good idea. I think you all are sitting here because you understand um, its uh, benefits uh, and its drawbacks. Um, what we don't like to do is whack-a-mole treatment. If I see a patient um, who has had uh, a laser focal therapy and they have recurrence at the uh, treatment site and one or two new sites, that's a whack-a-mole. That's a patient who um, probably, and in most cases, does have uh, aggressive uh, cancer cell architecture and or high-risk genomics. So, um, you know, this is something we discuss with the patient at the time of their biopsy. You know, it's not all Gleason score. There are special genomic tests that we can send off and extract RNA from this specimen to determine is there low intermediate or high risk behavior in that tissue. So two genes that we did early research with are called ERG and P10. So here's um, some uh, research and literature on ERG, a known prostate cancer gene, and P10. These two genes I liken to a, a cyclist on their bicycle. So um, if you're overexpressing ERG, if the tissue in the tumor overexpresses ERG, it's like riding your bike down a wild mountain trail as opposed to like a backcountry road, no fuss, no muss. Um, ERG overexpression is, is a bad thing. Now P10, uh, because all men are born with two P10 alleles, if one P10 is missing, it's like missing the front brakes of the bike. 
or the back brakes, one or the other. If both P10s are missing, it's like both brakes are gone. So when we talk about low, intermediate, or high score, you know, a low score of just one P10 being gone or just overexpression of ERG with both P10 intact, that's a low score. Then we get to intermediate and high scores where overexpression in the tumor RNA is present and one of the P10s is gone. And the worst case scenario is overexpression of ERG plus both P10s deleted. That's like no front brakes, no back brakes, and oh, by the way, you're on mountain trail. So that's a person who, although we may still do focal therapy on him, we do it with the understanding that this tumor is a mean one. And we may need to go in and retreat. They may need to have additional adjunctive treatments in addition to their focal therapy. And we're not shocked and amazed when they come back at a year, two years, three years, and there's something new brewing that we um, hadn't detected earlier because it wasn't there. And then another scenario that we do see on a frequent basis is insufficient tissue. Um, if we only see 5% tumor involvement of that little wormy angel hair pasta sized specimen of flesh, if there's only a little bit of cancer in that specimen, it's not enough for them to extract the RNA, do the replication, and then do um, the, the analysis. So we're at um, 8.17 Eastern. Jim, do you want me to keep going and cut off at 8.30, or shall we go to questions now? I think you can keep Hello? going if you'd like, but uh, why don't you get some questions, and then we'll go from there. Okay, let me run with the very end, and then we'll get the questions. Okay, so ERG and P10 were super 14, 15 years ago. It was kind of all we had. Then I heard of this cool thing called the cipher that they did after prostatectomy. They take the prostate out, slice it, look for the tumor, take the tissue and extract RNA and run the cipher on the whole mount tissue. So I went to the guy uh, who developed this test at the American Urological Association meeting around eight or nine years ago. And I'm like, hey, when are you ever gonna do the cipher on biopsy cores? And he goes, never. And I said, why not? And he goes like, they're garbage. Why would I? Because they're kind of, uh, uh, you know, random, and we, we just sort of don't know what we're getting. Why would we do a very expensive test on something we don't know? And I said, well, what if I gave you gold? What if I gave you cores, little bits of tissue that were extracted from the scariest looking part of the tumor on MRI, that lowest ADC part of the tumor? Is that enough? tissue to extract the RNA and run to cipher. And he thought about it and he goes, let me think about it. So fast forward to February of 2016, decipher for biopsy was released. The first thing I did was I went in our phase one cohort for which I had original specimens, pre-treatment specimens, and six years worth of clinical outcomes. And I had all these patients consent to a research study looking at their tissue. And I was able to do correlation to clinical outcomes. It was fascinating. So in addition to doing the 22 gene clinical panel that is Decipher, uh, they made some research panels for me. Plus, I had these men consent to having all 1.4 million genomic markers in their specimen looked at. And so I got a typical clinical report, which was low intermediate or high risk, and I got my research use only 1.4 million uh, gene marker report. Uh, this all has been in the literature. Uh, everybody knows that Decipher is a great prognostic indicator for prostate cancer-specific mortality, better than other nomograms and uh, prognostic tools. And so to show you its value, let's look at some case studies, and then we'll wrap up. This guy uh, pretty much had, uh, um, uh, excuse me, I have to make this go away. So um, this guy had a laser focal therapy of a tumor in 2015, 
And remember, even though Decipher wasn't available till 2016, I, ha I had access to this tissue because they have to preserve it for, I believe, seven years in the laboratory. So I was able to go back and get those and have the pathologist send it to the Decipher lab and get scores on these guys. So his score was a kind of intermediate lowish for Decipher and low for ERGMP10. Then we did a six month biopsy on him and he was negative and he's living happily ever after. Ta da! Next guy, treated with laser in 2015. I procured his pre treatment course. Look at his Decipher score, super low, 0.15. There's where he's falling. He had a low uh, ERG and P10. He had some overexpression of ERG, but his brakes were good. His P10 was intact had his front brakes and his back brakes. Then look at this guy, negative six month biopsy. I'm not gonna say it was predictable, but you know, he was low risk by all accounts. So unsurprising that a six month biopsy would be negative. Next patient, this person was treated in 2014. He had a negative six month biopsy, which um, when I looked at his six-year history with us, it made sense that the initial tissue that was procured before his treatment was high risk, 0.75. What happened with him was his MR-guided biopsy was positive two years after his therapy, and we detected recurrent 3 plus 4 at two years post-treatment. So. The surprising thing for me here was that he had a negative six month biopsy. I would have ex expected that to be positive, but sometimes in these high risk genomic situations, the recurrence is gonna happen, but it might not be immediately. So we picked it up at two years. He also had his normal one year follow up, one year MRI, nothing to biopsy, but then at two years, there was something abnormal that was biopsied and sure enough, um, it was three plus four. Last case is a patient who, for me, was very special and very unusual. So he presented to us um, at um, a very relatively young age. He was 55 at presentation, but this is when he was 60. Uh, we detected a recurrence. Um, his laser was done in 2011 at the age of 55. Then he had it done again in 2012. His, his Decipher score, 0.82, is one of the higher ones that I've seen. And over the years, you know, we followed him, followed him, followed him. And then um, in 2016, his laser was repeated in August because his PSA continued bouncing up and up and up. And it was unsurprising that with a Decipher score of 0.82, um, he did develop this recurrence. The interesting thing about him was also in his genomic um, uh, panel, not the clinical one, the research use only one. He was overexpressing something strange. Uh, it's called uh, glutathione peroxidase. While it's associated with prostate cancer, it's also associated with colorectal cancer. We uh, detected lymph node metastasis in this patient, which everyone assumed was related to his prostate cancer story, but in fact, he'd never had a colonoscopy and it was related to colorectal cancer. So a lot of these genomic tests that we're running these days, they don't just reflect prostate cancer status, they also reflect other uh, malignancies that we could get ahead of and um, control before they control you. So I'm going to close quickly with an article that I think is really important. This was published a few years ago, 2017. Bottom line is the target must be hit. If we're going to do precision treatment, we're going to do precision medicine, the specimens that we're taking have to be precise. You can't just do random willy-nilly biopsy of heaven knows what and expect your results to be meaningful. You have to hit the target. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, close things out. And uh, I have a little uh, 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 analogy that I like to do talking about Mozart's uh, piano sonata in C major, which is considered a, a, a simple symphony. 
and then Rachmaninoff, Isle of the Dead. My nephew's a musicologist, and uh, he he helped me to convey the message that symphonies of aberrations are what cause the badness, you know, and it and it, it's now easy to pick up on these things and to detect these aberrations and get ahead of them and control them again before they control you. I have to give credit to our fearless leader, Dr. John Feller, and his partner, Dr. Stuart May, who believed in this before anybody else did and let me run crazy in, in my lab there in Indian Wells. My partner, Roger McNichols, uh, my research colleague, Roger, was instrumental in developing the visual aid system. Um, Axel Winkle from uh, in vivo Germany, who created the hardware that lets us get at the things that nobody else can get at. And of course, our super technologist, Wes Jones, our uh, radiologist, Dr. Steve Gunberg, our urologist, Dr. Jeffrey Hers, and last but not least, Dr. Rob Toth, our biostatistician. So tonight we covered a lot, the history of biopsy strategies, evolution of multiparametric MRI, our clinical trial, and tissue-based genomics. If you have any questions you think of later and prefer to email them to me directly, uh, my email is simply bernadette at halodx.com. Um, again, my conflicts of interest aren't many. It's just my academic standing at Radboud and my patent pending. And I'm also on faculty at UC Riverside School of Medicine.